start admitting people. All right, uh, welcome everybody to a Free Thinkers Corner and um, another uh, uh, Frightmare Before Christmas author event. Today we have Sherry Sebastian Gabriel. She is a, um, her fiction, uh, short story fiction has appeared in numerous anthologies, including the dystopian states of America. Her first novel is called Spirits, and I have a short video. I will get up here. Oh, there we go. Tori Garrett is a haunted woman. Haunted by the life she took. Haunted by guilt. Haunted by an unquenchable thirst for alcohol. She tries to run away from her problems. But a mother's grief sends her on a collision course with death. slay her own demons? Can she put down the bottle? Or will she be destroyed by the spirits that haunt her? go your first novel spirits uh cherry welcome to a free thinker's corner hi everybody it's so wonderful to see you all thank you so much for coming so would you like to talk a little bit about your your work your short stories your short fiction your um and your novel yourself Absolutely. Before I do that, I, I do want to direct your attention to the chat box. Um, I have a couple of fundraisers that I'd really like to um, shout out real quick. Um, uh, you know, 2020 has been one of those years. Um, I referred to it earlier on Facebook as a poop sandwich, and it literally has been. Um, but uh, Dave Thomas, who uh, was previously on the horror show with Brian Keene, has had a rough couple of years health wise. Um, and uh, he. I think he just found out that he has a tumor on his lungs. He's still trying to um, get everything sorted with that and he needs help. Um, so the second link that you'll find in the chat box is to Dave's um, GoFundMe. Um, the uh, first link, I probably should have gone in the other direction, so sorry. Um, but the first link is to Lovecraft Arts and Sciences. Um, Lovecraft Arts and Sciences operates Necronomicon. Um, they also operate a bookstore in Providence. Um, I've performed there. I've read some of my fiction there. I know a lot of my friends have read there. Um, it's a, a great institution in Providence um, for creatives to promote their work. Um, so if you could, uh, you know, donate to either of these, um, it would be much appreciated. So thank you all. Um, and now let's get down to the to the nitty gritty. Let's let's talk about spirits. Sure. Do you um, want to go? Uh, yeah. Go ahead and talk, talk um, away. Yeah, uh, Tori Garrett uh, is the is the protagonist in my in my novel, um, and I've described her as a train wreck, and and she really is. But um, but she's a really tragic tragic character too. Um, you know, she accidentally hit and killed a teenage girl um, with her car, and she just can't cope with it. And she and she turns to alcohol to um, deal with that sort of crippling depression. Um, and she gets she gets fired from her job because she just 
doesn't stop drinking. Um, she, she's been drunk on the job, loses her job, um, and decides to run off to Cape May, New Jersey to try to dry out, um, try to like reassemble some normalcy in her life. Um, she had vacationed with her family there um, when she was a child. And so it has some sort of, you know, connection with her. And she, she hopes that it can help her get her life back together. Um, but the titular spirits here, um, they have other plans. Uh, so if I could, I will jump right in and do a little reading from, uh, from spirits to kind of introduce you to her um, and, and some of the stuff going down uh, in her world. The second floor communal baths floor had a permanent layer of grit from thousands of sandy bare feet padding to and from the toilet and tub. Tori leaned over the toilet and vomited clear fluid into it. Shuddering, she peeled off her clothes and shuffled to the glass encased shower. The mirror over the sink revealed red brown droplets across her ghost pale, ghost pale face. She screeched open the glass. Nightmare memories of the telephone booth at the dead end swirled in her mind. The voice from the phone echoed. She stopped in and yanked the door shut until it, until it sealed. The water sprayed down, cold at first. It shocked her back to life and gradually warmed. Red gathered at the drain. She stumbled backwards. It smelled rusty and soon it ran clear. Tori unwrapped a bar of soap and ran it over her body, lathering up the grime and sweat that lived on her skin. There was something about the boxed in shower that made her feel safe and protected, even from the undulating terrors that constantly tormented her. It was the same comfort a blanket gave her. Uh, this, I'm sorry. It was the same comfort a blanket gave her. She knew the enclosure couldn't protect her, but it brought her a moment of peace, a sense of security that makes people hide under the blankets when they hear a strange noise in the night. Do they really think it'll stop someone from murdering them? Probably not, but it's soothing all the same. She closed her eyes, letting the war warmth envelope her and the soap wash away all the bad things. Her eyes snapped open at a sound she couldn't quite place. A beige outline blurred against the pebbled glass of the shower doors. Her eyes were trained on it, hunting for movement. It was statue still. A flinch shuffled the watercolor painting blur and Tori gasped, who's there? Her voice bounded off the glass, every nerve tensed in her body. Exposed and vulnerable, a real person was far more of a threat than any ghostly figure. The enclosed, in the enclosed shower drew, drew, drew darker. The chunky grunting of someone clearing their throat rang out. She pressed her back against the smooth, cold tile. A sliver of shock went down her spine. The blurred beige blob on the other side of the glass neared. It touched the handle to the door and the entire glass rattled. Tori tried to breathe around the lump in her throat. Hot tears worked up in her eyes. The water continued its steady strum, but all its comfort was, pre was gone. Who is there? The door edged open and some of the shower spray tickled, trickled onto the floor. Tori shouted, her arms went defensively to her breasts and her left and her leg lifted instinctively to accommodate some modicum of modesty. It was coming in. A yellow puffy hand waved almost like a party clown waves, waves at a little kid. Its breath was heavy, perfumed with rot and the all too familiar fumes of booze. Hey, pumpkin, the voice growled, hard from a life of whiskey sours and too many Marlboro Reds. Her tears came in jagged bursts now as she watched her father climb into the shower with her. He was swollen to twice his normal size. Skin looked like a bruised banana peel. What's the matter, kiddo? Why don't you get on out of the shower and I'll take you down to the nut house for some pecan bars. Then maybe we'll hit the beach. <laughs> Gotta pick up provisions first, all out of Bacardi. What do you say? I'll give you a sip of my rum and Coke. It's been a while since you had a drink. Isn't it time for another? The water arced around him, never touching his clothes. He wore a brown sheepskin car coat and the floppy green fisherman's hat that made him look moronic. But the hateful glare in his eyes chilled her down to her bones. The reverberation of her own scream rang in her ears. Dad? The word croaked from her throat. The sound even shocked her. He extended a cartoonish bloated hand. His expression was tender and empathetic, fatherly. The word infuriated Tori. Her father had never been fatherly. Come on, get out of the shower. It's time to get something to drink. I know you're thirsty, baby. 
The whole body tremors overtook her. She needed to get out. She needed a drink. Her throat felt like hot sand. A heavy weight settled on her as she gathered her wits. If he was standing before her, bloated and smelly, vague, a vague betrayal of himself, he must be. She bashed herself against the glass and the door shimmied open. She felt exposed and scampered to pull a towel from the shelf above the toilet tank and wrapped her body in it, eyes trained on the shower. The tinkle of water against the bare tile floor was the only sound. She couldn't see inside. The door she'd opened swayed almost shut again. She hesitated for a moment, then moved, each step a shamble. She put a hand on the door and nudged it open with her fingertips, too afraid to reach out completely, lest something clutch her by the wrist. The stall was empty. She stood shivering and wet, confounded and horrified. She snapped out of her stupor and realized she was making crazy ass theories about her father's death based upon a vision that might not have even been real. She shut off the faucet. She dried herself, but the thought of going back to her room made her shudder. She'd have to face reality sooner or later, even if that reality meant jail time for walloping Amelia over the head, but now she was naked and growing colder by the minute. Tori walked upstairs and grabbed the same gin bottle she'd sworn she'd hit Amelia with and took a drink. And that, my friends, is Tori Garrett, who is going through some stuff, as you can tell. That was very good. Um, sounds very, very interesting. Um, and I'm probably gonna have to pay a royalty for saying this, but uh, like in the trailer, um, Christopher Golden mentioned that your, of course, now my video is not gonna work. But anyways, um, uh, he equated your 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 novel to uh, Rick Hatala and Charles L. Grant. And anybody else that you would compare um, your books to and, your, and even your short stories? You know, I mean, getting that comparison, if I can just, for a moment, um, that was probably the greatest thrill of, of my career being compared to Rick and Charlie. Um, you know, I've, you know, I read their stuff growing up, you know, as, as a kid in high school and, and to have that kind of comparison was just astounding. Um, I've gotten a lot of comparisons for, for spirits, um, to Stephen King. I know it sounds cliche and, you know, Dave Sims from Cemetery Dance um, compared it heavily to The Shining, um, which I, I can see it's a hotel in the off season uh, with an alcoholic protagonist. And I think it's one of those cases where you're so um, influenced by something that you don't even realize that it's influenced you. Um, uh, but a, another friend of mine read it and, and compared it to Thinner. Um, which I never would have thought about, but there's a curse involved. And I think that's con the connection that he made there. So, um, you know, a couple of King books and very different ones um, have, you know, Spirits has been compared to, so. You were, uh, you had joined us uh, in your husband's um, uh, uh, interview yesterday. And um, you had mentioned that your work is more um, well, let's start with this. So you've been writing for about a decade or so. Did it start before that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I started writing stories when I was about seven or eight. Um, you know, I was that nerd in class who always finished with my work early. And so I'd sit there and like, you know, come up with these silly stories. And my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Kimber, um, started collecting them. And he told me, I'm going to, I'm going to collect all of your stories so that when you're famous, I can say that I, I was like, responsible for it. So a uh, big shout out to Mr. Kimber, wherever he may be, because he started collecting my stories when I was in fifth grade. And, uh, you know, he made me feel like I could, I could do it, you know? So it was always good to have, have that teacher who really like nurtures your, your, you know, talents. Yeah. Yeah. So you described your work as, as I believe it was cyberpunk. The, the story in, um, in uh, Dystopian States of America is definitely a cyberpunk story. Okay. Um, and early on, um, when I started writing, um, I was very much into science fiction. I read a lot of science fiction authors when I was young, um, starting probably with Ray Bradbury. Um, and I know Greg Bastianelli, who was here on Monday, uh, talked about a lot about Ray Bradbury and, and how he was such an influence. Um, and I would say that's that's true for me as well. Um, a lot of my early influences were science fiction writers. Um, and that was kind of my first love. But I think a lot of science fiction, um, there's an easy jump to horror um, because I feel like so much of, of technology and the future and what is unknown can be pretty scary. 
So is that why you made the jump to, well, would you consider spirits um, a, a dark fantasy more than horror or thriller? Would you, or is that more of a subgenre of? I wouldn't. I wouldn't consider it dark fantasy. I would. I would just consider it quiet horror, um, uh, along the lines of those, you know, early '80s ghost stories. At its heart, at its heart, spirits is a ghost story. So, what made you decide to write the ghost story um, instead of more of the science fiction, cyberpunk style uh, short stories? I, I think that you know, I've done both. Um, I think this particular story was just born out through. Um, through just kind of ruminating on a real life horror um, that happened in in my in my town that I live in, um, there was this young kid. He was um, seventeen or eighteen. Um, was hit and killed by a uh, by a car um, not far from here. And uh, you know, I had that kind of moment of just, oh my god, how horrible as a parent to have your kid, you know, really at the beginning of their life. Um, just struck down that way and and just how how awful that must have been uh, and then the gear started kind of grinding about well what about the person who hit him I mean what happens to that person what person what, what happens to the person who has has done this awful thing that you know they didn't mean it was a it was an awful accident but how do you live with that how do you move on with your life and I very much liked the idea of trying to get into that person's head and figure out how they cope and what if they can't so you took um so we've had some mystery writers who would take some real life stories um, and do a whole lot of research to try to portray that story but in a fictional story did you do that with, with this one here kind of take that story um do some research into it to get an idea of the background of this tragedy uh real life tragedy and then kind of make a speculative fiction out of it? Not really. I mean, I, I feel like I didn't want to put on display this sort of very personal and private tragedy. Um, so, you know, it's fully fictionalized. Um, and, and, you know, every, every, everything in spirits is a, is a completely fictionalized event. Um, I, I just felt like it would be really disrespectful to the, pe the you know, the family of this kid to, to try and be like nosing into it. But, um, I did do a lot of research into alcoholism and its effects on, you know, the brain and, and the body. Um, you know, certainly I've had people with, you know, um, substance abuse, abuse issues in my family. I've never experienced that. I don't know what it feels like. Um, I don't know how, I, I don't know how that works. I, I don't know how it affects your your brain and and your body. So I did do a lot of research into alcoholism and how it affects the brain and um, your functions. So let's talk about some of your um, your short stories. What is your favorite short story that you wrote? Oh my goodness, <laughs> putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, I, I love Revolt, and as I mentioned um, at Matt's event last night. Um, I just think it was it was cathartic in a lot of ways to take some anger and and just kind of get it out onto the page. Um, and uh, you know, uh, that's probably one of my favorite stories. I didn't want to stop writing it, and I you know I, I actually considered expanding it into something bigger, but um, I just I feel like the way that the story ends, it just wouldn't have been um, you know a, a possibility. I have to agree about the cathartic nature of writing. I went through a, well, you can say the, the, the midlife crisis thing or whatever, but I just sat down. I did poetry, but it was very dark and angry poetry, but it, it helped. It helped a lot. Um, so I can definitely see that aspect of it. Um, what, um, how difficult was it going from writing short stories to writing a full novel? I wouldn't say it was that difficult. Um, I, I think that the length of a story, you know, every story ends up the length that it should be, I think. Um, you know, I feel like everything has sort of a natural flow to it. And if something is is a short story, then when I've reached the end, I, you know, I know that this is the story that I needed to tell. Um, same with spirits. I, I think I knew from the beginning that it was going to be a longer piece. Um, I think that I knew uh, it was going to be more involved. Um, but, but I don't think that there was that big of a jump between doing short stories as opposed to doing, um, you know, a, a novel. I just think it kind of naturally came to that length. 
so in spirit is it, is it more was it more you just kept going did you do the outline are you the pantser or, or just kind of flowed i am a pantser um for the most part i will tell you that the um project that i'm working on now it's it's the first time as a writer that i've ever really worked with an outline and there's so much going on in this in this project that I want to make sure that I'm clear on everything and I have everything, you know, kind of an outline for myself just to remind myself of what's going on because there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, but for the most part, I'm a pantser. Uh, I, I know Tony Tremblay, who was here earlier this week, mentioned that, you know, he feels like sometimes um, an outline kind of takes some of the creativity out of it. And I can definitely, um, definitely see that, you know, you kind of, you know, your characters tell you what they want to do. So with spirits, you kind of took a real life event and, and turned it into a into a fiction book. Um, do you take any other real life events or or circumstances, family members? Well, again, spirits is based on well, you use the name of a friend of yours. Um, have you done that with other, um, or is that gonna, in your new book? Um, I have used my friends' names, um, even though I just like to point out Tori Boone is not a, a drunken train wreck. I love you, Tori. <laughs> she is nothing like Tori Garrett, uh, just a namesake. Uh, but certainly I've used, I've used my friends' names before, um, you know, uh, I, and, and it's kind of fun. Um, I don't think I've used any of my friends' names in uh, the project that I'm working on now. I'm trying to get out of that habit, I think. But, uh, but sometimes it's fun to just, you know, say, hey, you're going to be a drunken train wreck today. <laughs> So your husband, Matt, uh, was on yesterday. So you obviously are both writers. How is it working um, or ha having another writer as a spouse? It's actually amazing um, because I think it's great to have somebody who gets you and who understands your need to, um, you know, have that alone time to ruminate. And it's also really great to have somebody that you can say, hey, can I read this to you? And I know he's going to be honest. Um, and I, I know he's going to say, well, you know, what if you did this instead? Or I think it would flow better if you did this. And that's so amazing. Uh, I think I have, uh, you know, an in-house beta reader and he does as well. Um, so that's kind of a unique position to be in. And, uh, but, but it's wonderful. I mean, it's, it's great to have a fellow creative person, um, you know, under the same roof. Have you ever um, come up with an idea or he come up with an idea, bounce it off each other and then it kind of snowballs and snowballs and okay, I want to write it. No, I want to write it. No, I want to write it. The, we don't usually fight over that. We do, um, we do brainstorm with each other all the time. And, you know, if I'm stuck on something, I can say, hey, can I talk this out with you? And nine times out of 10, when I come away from brainstorming with Matt, I, I've got it. It's like, it clicks. And I'm like, yes, you're right. That's, that's where this needs to go. Um, and he does the same with me. And we kind of talk things out. And, and it's so wonderful to have someone to, to, who gets it and, and, you know, he understands getting stuck on things. So I don't feel, you know, bad about, Hey, saying, Hey, I need you to, to talk this through with me. So how did you meet? Did you, were you at like, um, do you go to those Nikons and, and other conventions and stuff for, we met 10 years ago at Nikon. Um, and you know, I, I just, We've only been together, I say only, but it's been since 2018. Um, but, you know, we were friends for a really long time and saw each other every year at Nikon. And one day we were just like, wait, this is a thing, you know, you and me, we should do this. <laughs> so do you take, you said you take, um, well, you're, you're more of a pantser and you just kind of go, but do you have like notes all over the place? Do you carry a notebook with you, uh, a recorder? I scribble things down a lot. Yeah, I, I keep notebooks everywhere. And, you know, half the time, um, you know, I can be pretty unorganized sometimes. So I'll write stuff down in a notebook and forget which notebook I've written it in. Um, but I, I just now downloaded Scrivener and I'm liking it because of that, that I can uh, just, you know, make notes for myself um, in Scrivener and um, just find it there. Uh, so, uh, but I, I have been, I have a bad habit of like scribbling things and forgetting where, <laughs> where I'm scribbling. 
<laughs> so what is it? Is that a computer program that writers can use to, to take notes and stuff or? It is. Never and heard of that before. Yeah, you can write your whole manuscript. Um, anything that you need, you can keep a, a list of your characters and their traits and different chapters and chapter outlines. If, if you want to get that um, granular about it, you can outline each chapter, um, which I don't know that I use necessarily all the tools that Scrivener has, um, but I, I find that the note taking part of it is is very useful to me because I can just, you know, everything that I need is kind of in this program and I don't have to go searching for 10 notebooks that I have misplaced. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I lost my train of thought here. Um, so your, your books are published or at least um, Spirits is published through Haverhill House Publishing. How did you get involved with that? Was it with Matt or or was that sort of on your own or? I've known John McElveen for, for quite some time. Hi, John, I see that he's here. Um, and I was at StokerCon in Providence a few years ago and we were just sitting around in the dealer's room and chatting and you know, he was like, what are you working on? And I'm like, well, would you mind if I pitched you what I'm working on? And I'm like, it's very, you know, quiet horror, ghost story. And he kind of went, yes, I'm listening. <laughs> that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, um, Max Wheelhouse is more, uh, you know, quiet horror in, in the tradition of, of Charles Grant and, uh, and Rick Hodala. In fact, I know he's published some of Rick's stuff. Do you use, well, you mentioned that your husband is, you kind of play uh, off each other as far as beta readers and stuff. Do you use other people outside to, to give you another opinion? Absolutely. Yeah, we have friends who are also writers. A lot of our friends are writers and, you know, we have no qualms about saying, hey, would you read this for me? In fact, my buddy Barry is here. Hi, Barry. Barry has read so much of my stuff. Thank you. Um, and I read his stuff. Uh, we have a lot of friends who, you know, we share work and it's, it's, um, a really great fun community and you know if you're if you just need an extra set of eyes on something nine times out of ten people are like sure send it to me and and that's so that's so wonderful john says she uh, that you put him in a headlock and i'll do it again too mcelveen <laughs> <laughs> um so with your with your other short uh, collections um were those self-published or were those through another publisher or heroes? I don't have a collection yet. Um, I've had a lot of stories in anthologies before. Um, okay. And, you know, I, I think I went about the, uh, from my understanding, I went about it kind of, you know, back assward. I, I think that most people have a collection out before they put out a novel. Um, and I'm still on the fence about collections. And, you know, maybe I'll ask y'all, um, you know, hit me up in the chat. Are collections worth it? Uh, and I don't know. I, do people buy collections? Um, I have enough short stories, I think, for a collection. Um, I just, I don't know that they sell. I don't know if people would buy them. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm legitimately confused as to as to whether or not they're you know uh, worthwhile. So, no, oh, like I had asked your husband last night, have you ever thought of taking any of your short stories and turning them into reworking them into a, a novella or um, or a full novel? I have. I've toyed around with some short short stories that I might want to expand. Um, Revolt was that way, but I just I don't think I can. Um, and as much as I needed to write that story, I feel like it is emotionally just a draining uh, piece. And I feel like trying to work myself through a novel like that, I, I don't think that I could just I couldn't take it, I don't think. But, uh, you know, certainly I've considered it. Uh, and and if I did write something that, you know, I, I felt I could expand out, you know, I, I don't think I'd have any problem with that. You know, I, I'd certainly consider it. Do you, do you ever go back and read some of your short stories, and especially the real early ones when you were starting and say, you know what, this really isn't the way I can write now, knowing what I know. Um, maybe I should go back and rework it and, and, and see how it goes. Or you say, nope, this is the beat. This is how I started. This is the way it's going to stay. You know, I, I look back on some stuff, some of the early stuff that's been published. And 
I kind of cringe. And I think a lot of writers do that because I think for most of us, I, well, maybe I should only speak for myself. I feel like I'm my own worst enemy. Um, when I read something, I'm just like, oh my God, why? What was I thinking? Uh, so I don't know that I want to go back and revisit the, the early stuff, but, but I do think that I have improved my craft. I, I think that I've, you know, gotten better as a writer and I, I feel like you know, I've gotten more publishing credits over the years. And I feel like the more acceptance as you get, you know, you can kind of, you know, see the progress. Um, so I don't know that I want to go back and, and, you know, kind of rework something that, that I did years ago. Um, but yeah. Well, John says, um, as, as far as the collections, he says, not as much as novels, but they appease uh, fans in the interim. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go and take all your short stories, and put them into a collection would you rework maybe some of the earlier pieces at that point or again maybe arrange them to show a progression of your writing style change i don't know i don't know that I, would, I don't necessarily know that i would choose stories from my early days i i think i'd probably focus on um some of the more recent stories some things that i'm you know i would like to showcase rather than this is just kind of a you know um I don't, I don't even know what the proper term was, whatever the music equivalent of a discography would be. Um, but uh, I'm sure there's a word for it. And I'm a writer and I can't think of it. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily know that I'd want it to, to be this sort of, uh, you know, going back to the beginning and, and necessarily publishing everything. A bibliography. Thank you, John McElveen. That's why you're a publisher. <laughs> you knew that word existed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that I, I'd want it to be comprehensive. I, I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, just, but more of a showcase of, of some work that I'm, I'm proud of. Um, so your Matt asks, weren't you also contemplating writing a collection of connected novellas a la Charles L. Grant? I was. I, I, we used to pass this really creepy, skeevy looking hotel. I'm convinced it was like um, a sort of halfway house, um, because there was always like these like skeevy looking guys hanging out in front. Uh, and I wanted to base kind of like the, the place and maybe it's more like a mosaic novel is, is what I'm thinking of. Um, where there's a series of events that go in and out of certain time frames, like certain eras, but all based in this particular hotel. Um, and uh, I even had a, I even had a title. It was called the Gabriel Hotel, because like the Morrison Hotel. But oh, uh, thank you, Craig Wolf. Uh, you know, more like a mosaic novel, I think, rather than rather than a collection. If that answers your question, my love. <laughs> <laughs> now, do, do you have, do you do one idea at a time or do you have, have multiple ideas with just sort of notes in a notebook or a folder or on that, that program there that you want to eventually get back to when you're finished with what you're doing now? Or do you just work on one thing at a time, then move on to the next one? My brain is like a whirlwind. I don't think I ever work on one thing at a time. I think I've always got something cranking and usually it's not the thing that I should be working on. It's usually something that's like, you know, 10 projects out and I need to be focusing on the thing that I'm working on now. Uh, so I try really hard to focus on one thing at a time. Sometimes it's really hard to um, completely devote all of my time to that one thing. Um, most of the time I'm pretty good. I, I can focus on um, you know, one project at a time, but I'm usually taking notes for things like three or four projects down, down the line. Uh, I like to keep notes because I know that I've got a lot cranking in my head and I got to get it out or else I'm not going to remember it. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, we interviewed one author, uh, a couple weeks ago and he has like three or four projects going at one time. And the question was, of course, how do you keep them all straight? And he's just able to compartmentalize with a lot of notes and outlines for, for each one. But um, so, what do you do when you get stuck? So you're sitting, you're writing. You know, we we had some who would go have a cigar and a and a glass of scotch. Some that would go listen to music. Some would just go and run. What do you do when you get stuck? To, uh, when you're working on a project. A lot of different things. Um, I, I do read a lot and, and I kind of feel like if I'm stuck, maybe the thing to do is to read some books within that particular subgenre that I'm, that I'm writing in. Um, sometimes that kind of knocks the cobwebs loose. 
um, you know, and, and working out is, is great. Um, I, you know, I, I love to work out and I feel like a lot of times that that is very cathartic and clears my head. Um, as I mentioned, brainstorming with my husband, uh, Matt is, is helpful sometimes. Um, and just, I, I feel like if you, if you stay so focused on the thing that you're stuck on, I, I think it's harder to break out of, out of being stuck. Um, I, I think sometimes you just need to kind of live for a little while. Um, and life sometimes hands you the thing that you need. Um, you know, just in your day to day, something may happen and you're like, that's the thing. That's the thing that I need to, you know, kind of put the pieces together. Who are the favorites that you like to read to, to just kind of clear your mind or to maybe draw inspiration from? Um, I am, I just started reading um, Christopher Golden's and I don't have any alcohol tonight or I would take a shot because Matt, <laughs> that if you mention Christopher Golden, you have to take a shot game. Uh, but I, I just started reading his latest Red Hands um, and I'm loving it so far. It's so different from most of Chris's stuff um, in that it gets pretty gory in, in the beginning. And uh, that's, that's, you know, Chris is really great at, um, you know, very quiet and, you know, more, um, you know, I, I don't know, he, he does mostly quiet stuff. And this is just kind of just right off the bat, really just violent and, and not in a bad way. It, it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. Anyway, I know, I know that's not the question you asked me, <laughs> but no, no. Uh, a lot of, a lot of writers, um, you know, love Ray Bradbury. I read a lot of Stephen King. Um, uh, Michael Bishop uh, is a science fiction writer that I've been following since I was in high school. Um, and I don't think he's putting out a lot of stuff these days. I, I think he's, um, I think he's ill. Um, but I, I read a lot of his stuff. Uh, and it kind of takes me back to my early days, uh, you know, writing science fiction. And, and that kind of inspires me. Who's the most famous writer that you've met? And who would you love to meet and just maybe sit down with a glass of wine or your favorite drink at a table and just chat with for an hour? The thing it is, I feel like I'm in such a, you know, wonderful position um, of all of the writers that I've met through Nikon. Um, you know, I, I think that the most famous, to answer your first question, the first, the most famous writer I've ever met was Joe Hill. Um, and he is just a fucking riot. He is so funny. Um, and just has this big personality and, and he's hilarious. Um, I think that I find myself kind of like in awe sometimes because, you know, I'll be hanging out with Chris Golden or James A. Moore or, you know, all of these amazing writers that I've read and have been reading for a long time. And you're just kind of like blown away, like, wow, I'm just... I'm just hanging out with these people who are amazing writers and I, I'm just always kind of kind of in awe. So I don't know necessarily, I, I think my cup runneth over. That's the, the answer to the question is that I've, I've had so many great times just hanging out with these amazing writers and, and I couldn't ask for any more than that. So for an inspired, well, let me get to this first. Uh, Tony has a question. If you did, uh, if you do read another author, why, uh, while you're working, do you worry about copywriting or copying their style? Not really. I, I think that at this point in my career, I've kind of, I've kind of found that voice. And, and I feel like, you know, I think that the inspiration is more in, wow, that's really amazing. I'll tell you another writer. Now, some, someone else just came to me, Jeffrey Ford. If you have not read Jeffrey Ford, you need to unfuck that. Um, every time I read something by Jeffrey Ford, I sit there and I think to myself, I wish that I had written this. It is so good. His stuff is so good. Um, but I don't worry about copying necessarily their style uh, because I think I have that voice. Um, but I feel like in reading some of their stuff, it's kind of like, hey, I think I can do this. You know, it kind of like something snaps in my head and I'm like, okay, I'm back. I can do this. <laughs> so Tori uh, congratulated you on saying the, um, the F word, <laughs> throwing an F bomb out there. I probably should have done a, like a disclaimer or a warning uh, before I started this that you will hear foul language and viewer discretion is advised. So I'll put that on. Yeah, I'll put that on the caption on the uh, on the Facebook uh, when I redo the comment thing on the Facebook uh, video. Um, so, how important do you for we're talking now about aspiring writers who may be watching this, 
uh, today or later. Um, how important is it to get out there to different, obviously we can't do it right now, but um, conventions and networking, um, other writers groups via Facebook or others writers retreats. How important is that a big part of how you really grew as a writer? I think for me individually, you know, I think yes. Um, I think that writing can be very solitary and, and I feel like if you don't have people to kind of bounce ideas off of, it can be, uh, you know, a, a little limiting. Um, so I would recommend going to um, some conferences and conventions. Um, and, you know, even if it's just a small writers group, I think that that could be really useful. Um, but I understand that a lot of writers are introverts and that can be really difficult um, for some people. So I, I recognize and have experienced that sort of social anxiety of just being around a big crowd. So, um, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, there are pros and cons. And, and if it's out of your comfort zone to be around a large group of people, um, you know, by all means, find something else. Uh, you know, cons aren't for everybody. Um, I think they're helpful though. Um, I think it just really depends on your personality. Um, I think that a small writer's group would probably be just as beneficial depending on the people in it. What about small or even big um, participating, not just going to be a spectator and walk around, but actually having a table set up with your books? How important is that? Is that something that you that you do? I think promotion, yeah. Well, in the before times, yeah, I, I think it was really helpful to, you know, put yourself out there, um, attend events, read if you can, have a, you know, a table of your books available. Um, I think it's really important, especially in this, in this era, to promote yourself. I think that all authors have to, um, you know, uh, I recognize that some of the big names maybe don't, but I think even they have to kind of, you know, push themselves. Um, because I, I just don't think that the marketing is, is there in, in most publishing companies anymore. One of the hard things that we find as, as booksellers and in, independent bookstores, especially, is local writers that we have don't promote the stores that they're in. Mm. And that's one of the things that we find is, is we feel is very important, not just for our self-preservation, but, you know, it's, it gets the word out to the potential followers. Um, um, what are some of the other marketing ideas um, that you've that you've done in the past? I mean, probably the typical bookmarks, um, you know, business cards and things. Um, one of the our writers that we have, uh, she would leave her books at uh, airports with her bookmark and book information on it as she took trips around the country doing book tours and stuff. Do you do anything something similar to that or? I do a lot on social media and I'm very um, lucky for multiple reasons that, that I'm married to Matt, but Matt is, uh, you know, very talented at, um, you know, web design and, uh, you know, video. So I, he did my book trailer for me uh, and I, I the, the video that you played earlier and, uh, you know, anything that I can kind of do on social media to, to promote, I do. Um, you know, we had this goofy thing a while back that I said it was, a, you know, an entertainment event, uh, chilling with spirits and, you know, starring Matt, uh, unwittingly starring Matt Beck where you know we'd follow him around and where he's reading and all of these weird things started happening uh you know so we try to get creative and and silly and and uh just do fun things to kind of promote the book so let's talk about your writing process now of course we know that you just sort of go in and write as you go is there a particular times that you like to write is there a particular setup that you like to have you know uh, we have one author who likes to she's more on the spiritual side so she taps a gong you know, one of those little tiny or bells um, before she starts just to kind of get in the mood. Is there anything like that that you do or? Not really. I mean, I, you know, I generally write in the morning. Um, that's, that's the time of day that I, that I write most often. Um, sometimes if I, if I'm really inspired and, and I've just had a lot going on during the day and I just didn't get around to it, sometimes I do write it in the evening. Um, but mostly I write in the morning before work. Um, I'm usually one of the first people up. Um, so it's nice to have that kind of quiet time. So I have my coffee and, and my laptop and I have that, that quiet time to create and, 
Um, so I, I think that that's a really great way to um, kick off every day. Um, so I at least have that kind of time, quiet time to um, be creative. Do you ever find yourself in the middle of a, a conversation or dinner or out with friends when we used to be able to be out with friends um, and all of a sudden just have an idea and just say, everybody just stop, leave me alone for a minute, grab a napkin or grab a, your notebook or whatever and just start writing? I, I don't know that that's happened a lot, but every now and then, uh, you know, I will, um, you know, uh, grab my phone, a little note section of my phone. I will write something down. If, if something occurs to me, I'll just be like, hold up. <laughs> I'm not going to remember this. So here's a little note in my phone to myself. What, what's, what's the longest stretch that you've gone in writing where you just got so into it? You were in such a great train of thought. Everything was flowing really well. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, my goodness, it's this time. I think when I was in the, the really the depth of writing spirit, um, I would just, it was just going and, you know, sometimes some weekend days, um, you know, the whole day would go and it'd be like, wow, I, I've literally been writing since like nine o'clock this morning and it's now dinner time and what the hell, you know, I think that when you get into that flow, sometimes you just have to have to let it happen. It doesn't happen often though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that you have more time or spend more time right now during the pandemic stuff or is it just sort of the same as as pre-pandemic writing I think, I think early in the pandemic I I had a really hard time I think a lot of writers did I, you know I would it would come and go I had like this idea um and another project I'm working on is a graphic novel script um and it it was kind of born of this idea that it was a dream that I had. It was a, a anxiety um, spawned dream that I had. Um, and it was so horrifying. Um, and I thought the only medium that I can think of for this is, is a graphic novel. So I've been working on a graphic novel script. Um, but for the most part, the pandemic has really been really bad, I think, for creativity. Um, I think people are just kind of like, there's no horror that we could come up with that's kind of worse than what we're dealing with now uh and i'm laughing and it's not funny <laughs> yeah. so so with a graphic novel script how is that different from writing a novel or, or a short story i think it's way more complicated and i don't necessarily know what i'm doing um i i downloaded uh a software called superscript um and i've just kind of been winging it uh, i don't have an artist so if y'all have any artists out there hit me up um, I would love to find somebody to work with. Uh, I, I've never done this before, so uh, I'm kind of winging it. But um, but at the same time, I mean, I read a lot of graphic novels, uh, and uh, and uh, hopefully, I can just kind of feel my way through it. We have um, next week. We have, uh, I believe, she writes graphic novels or has one. Uh, uh, Catherine Cat. That's Scully, yeah. Scully, Scully, yep. Yeah, so she's going to be on next week. I'm really looking forward to speaking to her because she'll be the first graphic novelist that we've we've spoken with. Um, I don't know much about them. We have a great comic book store here just a few miles um, next town over. Um, but I'm not that familiar with them. I, I do like them, starting to get a few of them. So it'd be very interesting. I'd love to see, though, what you... Uh, who's... Did you... I don't remember if you mentioned it, but did you mention who was doing the illustrations or... Do you do the illustrations too? I don't have an artist yet. So if anyone knows artists, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> um, Tori's asking, uh, would you ever want to write an autobiography? Me? Is there anything so interesting about me? I don't, I think I'm like the most boring person <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> and and Tori Boone, I have known you for 20 years. Would you really want me to, <laughs> to write an autobiography and include stories about you? <laughs> What do you feel are one of some of the most, again, we're talking to um, aspiring writers or those who are just starting out. Um, what are some of the most important aspects in writing a book? Hmm. We obviously know editing. What are some of the... I think, I think it's one of the most important things is to write characters that people care about. They don't have to be good people. Um, I think that Tori in, in Spirits is not a very good person. At least she's not in the beginning. 
Um, but I feel like you have to write compelling characters. You have to write about people that, um, that your readers are actually going to care about. Um, you you have to write about people that, um, that your readers want to root for. Um, and I, I feel like everyone loves a redemption story. Everyone likes to read about people coming through their challenges. And I feel like writing compelling characters is, is probably one of the most important parts of writing. Do you ever, do you have any ideas of maybe writing an ending that doesn't turn out? too well or do you think that that type of book isn't really that um desirable i mean maybe even especially now thinking the pandemic most people will probably want to have the 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 happy ending sort of thing but um have you ever thought of going the other way with any of your books i've written stuff that has kind of a you know not great ending and not great meaning you know uh doesn't end well for for the protagonist and i feel like that's real. I mean, that's more realistic than a tacked on happy ending. Um, and I, I feel like if you can, you know, tell a compelling story, it may not necessarily end, you know, in a happy way, as, as long as you um, kind of bring the story to its natural conclusion, that natural conclusion doesn't necessarily have to be happy. So you'd be fine with writing an ending like that? Oh yeah, I've had care. I've killed off protagonists before. I, I have moms. <laughs> so John is asking, um, do you lock Matt in the basement when you write? <laughs> I do not lock Matt in the basement. Uh, although Matt replied, though um, they don't, you don't have a basement. And uh, John asked, it's the attic. Does he, it's the attic. Yeah. Well, John's volunteering to build a basement if you need him to. Um, Tori asks, well, maybe throw a few of our stories, your and Tori's stories together, uh, especially when you live together in New York City. Yeah, uh, yeah, we should throw in some of our New York City stories. That's so much fun. I don't know why. Tori and I se seem, when we, when we were living together, we seem to be like a magnet for weirdness. So maybe there is this, a book in here, Tori Boone. I think, you, I think you'll pull this, uh, pull this autobiography out of me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought of mashing a couple of your short stories together and making a, making either a, a novella or a, a, you know another short story out of the two or three? Not necessarily, uh, but I get what you're saying. Um, I've had like stories that have evolved. Like I was thinking about one thing and another project, and kind of I don't know. It would kind of forced me to take the story that I'm working on in a different direction. Um, certainly that's happened where I, I, I've taken a story in a direction I might not have otherwise taken it just based on a new project that I started working on. So that's definitely happened. Have you gotten into the middle of a story, things were going well, maybe it went off in the other direction and it just, just didn't work and just kind of rip the whole thing out, throw it away and or even just start the story and just say, forget it, this just is not working and just start all over again. It happens a lot, but but I think for me, um, I'll start something and then put it aside and you know, maybe work on some other things um, for a while and try to come back to it. And maybe uh, you know, time will uh, kind of give me a, a different perspective. I think that that's happened a lot. Uh, I try not to throw things away because I, I think that, you know, if I have an idea, it's worth kind of, you know, fleshing out a little bit, but sometimes it does take a little bit of uh, of time and and kind of, you know, thinking about it before, before it really uh, becomes viable as a story. Uh, Kim is asking, what kind of art are you looking for? Um, hmm. I comic book art? Uh, I, I don't know necessarily. Um, could you be more specific? Are, uh, are, you at a, are you at a point where you can share some maybe the, the plot as to what the story is about? Um, the story is um, about a, um, a woman named Stevie Hart who um, is trying to make it through um, this sort of outbreak, um, and and it's not like COVID. It's it's a biological weapon that was unleashed on um, unwittingly, like accidentally unleashed on on the American populace, and she's trying to get uh, from her home in um, Rhode Island to her grandmother's cabin in Alabama, um, and people are just violent and insane, um, and and she's trying to just 
make it with her young daughter um, to this cabin so that they can, um, you know, escape from this sort of madness that that's broken out in, in, in America. So that's, that's kind of the point. What's the difficulty in, in doing that? Is it trying to get a full normal sized paragraph down into just a few words to fit into that frame or two? I feel like you have to evoke with, you know, limited space. And, and I think that that's the real challenge is you've got to make sure that you're getting across what you want to say in, in such a small amount of space. Uh, most graphic novels are not the same length as, as a novel. Most of them are about a hundred pages. And in order to kind of, you know, get across, you know, this, all of these plots and subplots, it's, it's pretty complicated. So word choice is definitely a, an important, uh, important part of it. And, and absolutely, you have to, you know, no greater time, uh, is, you know, for show, don't tell, you know, you literally have to show. <laughs> so you mentioned the, the importance of reading, uh, readers connecting to your characters. Do you feel there's a line in the sand where an unreliable character becomes unlikable? Hmm. I, I think so. Um, and I feel like, I feel like there's a difference between, I, 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 hmm. sorry, now I'm cogitating. Uh, I think there's a difference between unreliable and unlikable. I, I think that that's the, the kind of the, the distinction we need to make. I think you can have an unreliable character who's perfectly likable, um, someone who's just maybe um, kind of, you know, dotty and maybe under the influence of, of drugs and alcohol. Um, I, I think that certainly um, someone who is um, maybe not completely conscious. Uh, I've certainly read a lot of stories, uh, you know, think about a story and I've compared the uh, spirits a lot to um, the story, The Yellow Wallpaper, um, where you have this character who's being gaslighted. Um, and so she's not a, an unlikable character, she's just an unreliable one. Um, so I, th I think there's a big difference between an unlikable character and, unre and an unreliable one. Um, if that answers your question, I, I don't know if it does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because there are some characters that, that I've read in stories where I just I just can't stand whenever it comes to the time, the point of reading the chapter or the section that they're back in. I'm like, oh, this this person is such an ass, you know, that you just don't want to read them anymore. Um, so it can be too much. It's one thing to be unlikable, but it can get to a point where it's too much. Do you see that happening or does does like your husband or any of your other beta readers say, you know what, this character is just such uh, a loser, irritating every time I, I read him? You know, I, I think that, and maybe this answers your question, Matt, um, that the point at which you just stop caring about that person, I, I think that that's the, the line in the sand um, moment where you're just like, I don't really care what happens to this person anymore. Um, and just, just, I don't care if they died. You know, I, I, th I think that's probably the line in the sand where you just stop caring. Um, you know, I, I think that at least I hope that Tori in, in spirits, you want to keep rooting for her. You want her to finally get her shit together. Um, and, you know, I think that we all love, as I said before, we all love redemption stories. We want people to finally pull themselves together. Um, and, and I think the line in the sand is, um, you know, if you still care about this person, you're, you're still going to want to keep, you know, pushing for them and, and rooting for them and saying, come on, get it together. Um, you know, I, you know, unpopular opinion. I, I don't know if you've ever, let's see. Oh, the Wally Lamb novel. Um, she's come undone. I don't know if anyone else has read that. And it's probably an unpopular opinion, but the main character in that book, I just stopped caring about her because she was just, I just think she got to the point where she was just an unlikable person to the point that I was just like, I don't care what happens to you anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mac. I know I'm talking about <laughs> As a writer though, have you ever gotten to the point where the care a particular character in your in your novel or in your story, but you've gotten invested so much time and energy into that character, but you just finally say, you know what, I just don't like this character anymore. I'm just gonna kill him off. I, I have actually removed characters from, from books. In fact, there were 
there were a lot more characters and spirits uh, in the first draft. And I removed whole characters just because I felt they were either, you know, superfluous. They were just, they served no real purpose or it felt like they were just kind of dumb and I didn't see the point for them anymore. So I, I don't necessarily think I've ever killed off a character that I, that I just didn't like, but I have removed them from, <laughs> from the manuscript. It's kind of like, ah, you don't serve any purpose. Get out of here. <laughs> um, have you ever thought about writing a sequel to Spirits? Yes. Um, and I feel like Spirits and, and Tori Boone, I know that you've been pushing me to write a sequel to Spirits because she needs to know what happens next. Uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but Spirits does end. I, I just, it's, it's open-ended. Um, and I did that because sure, it, it, it opens up the possibility for a sequel, but it's also, it, you know, Tori's story gets wrapped up. And, and I said what I needed to say about her life and, and what's going on with her. But I, I do see the potential for a sequel. Um, and probably in the next year or so, I'll, I'll get down to that and, and uh, write it. Mostly because Corey Boone will, uh, will attack me if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, we know another part, uh, an important part of uh, the finished product of the book is the cover. Uh, if you wouldn't mind holding it up again for spirits. Um, who, uh, who designed the cover? How much input did you have on that? Um, I love the cover to spirits. Um, it was uh, done by Dyer Wilk. Um, and I had some input on, uh, you know, I talked to Dyer at Nikon, um, the year that I signed the contract, I think, I think literally after signing the contract with, um, with Mac to publish spirits, um, you know, we had a, we had a conversation and he said, well, this is what I see. And I said, yes you know, this woman in a bottle. And I, I love that concept. It's so evocative. Um, it's just, it, you know, it, it sums up the novel in a picture. And I feel like that's so important um, when you're trying to sell a book. Um, you want it to really sum up what the book is about without giving too much away um, and, and really evoking emotion with it as well. Um, so uh, when I saw the, you know, the 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 first draft of the of the cover i was just i, I was blown away I'm like yes that's my cover i love it <laughs> you have ideas for your for your next one as far as what your cover is going to look like already or is that sort of when do you decide what you what you would like for for the cover to look like or you know, I, I don't know. I don't know that that ever like occurred to me. Um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of times it's the publisher who's like, yeah, I see this and, and you know, that's, that's what it is. Um, I don't really have a cover in mind for, for the next project. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I, maybe I should, maybe I should start thinking about that. <laughs> so I didn't know if, you know, if, if writers went off, obviously the title, you want to have something that's, uh, um, reflects what the what the book is about and, and, and the title but I just didn't I think this is the first time I've actually asked that if at what point do you decide what you'd like for for a for a cover or if it's you leave like say you leave it up to the editors and publishers to kind of throw do they throw ideas to you and you say yay or nay or how about this and kind of go back and forth yeah, yeah. I mean, this the process with with Mac was was very simple. It was just like here's here's what we're working on. What do you think? And you know, I don't know. Maybe it's because as a first time author, I was just so excited because when you see your book, it's like yes, that's it. And you know, I'm you know, it, I think I got lucky. My my cover is awesome, and I love it. And you know. I don't know, maybe it's my personality. I don't think that I'd be too difficult either way. It's just, you know, I, I kind of feel like the artist knows, what, you know, you have to trust your artist at some point and say, you know, this is how I see this. I've read the book and I feel like this is, this is the thing that evokes the most emotion and is going to convey what the book is about. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just afraid to be a jerk. <laughs> I don't know. They're like, no, this cover's not working for me. So uh, what do you think about an audiobook for a uh, version of your book? I don't know, Mac, where are we? I, I, I would love to have an audio book. I, I could see that happening. Um, you know, I, I don't think it has an audio book yet. At least I don't think it does, but, um, but yeah, I, I would love to have an audio book available. I've had people ask me about that before, um, but I don't know. 
well, it's time for my shameless plug. Um, Libro.fm, of course, is the one that we partner with and uh, sales through them come back to us. So it would be great to be able to promote uh, an audiobook for you whenever the time comes. Would you want to narrate it yourself or would you want to have somebody else narrate it? Um, and what famous person would you really like to narrate the book? You know, I, I wouldn't like to because I hate my voice. I, I'm like that kind of person who's like, ah, that's my voice. That's not cool. Um, I actually do know some audiobook narrators. Um, one that, uh, you know, she's just a wonderful person in general, and she's a great audiobook uh, narrator is Linda Jones. I don't know if any of you know her, but Linda's awesome. Um, and um, yeah, that's, I don't know in, in terms of like famous people. Um, I, I mean, I don't think that, you know, Samuel L. Jackson would be a great narrator for spirits. Just, you know, I, I don't drop the MF word that much. So I, I don't see, I don't see him in that role, but. <laughs> um, yeah, because the right person definitely makes, can make or break an audiobook. There's a lot of really good, um, they send us, uh, uh, free books every month just to kind of look over and see and that's how we get a lot of books for our store um i just don't have the time to sit down and read a 300 page novel it'll take me months but a, a few hours on audiobook is great um and there are just some books where they're so well written but unfortunately the narrator just didn't get the certain inflections right or the tone wasn't right or something but um would you like to see uh, your book as a as, as a movie and then who would you like to star in it? I would love to see Spirits as a movie. And, uh, you know, I've kind of been, uh, you know, talking to someone about, right, maybe writing, a book, I don't know. Um, and for a long time, I have pictured um, Sarah Paulson as Tori. Um, I think that she, you know, she's the right age range. She has the look. She can play this sort of, you know, train wreck of a person. I feel like she's just got that range. Um, for Amelia's character, I see um, Kelly Marie Tran, who was Rose Tico in um, The Last Jedi. I would, I can see her in that role. So yeah, I have been thinking about these things and, and who would you want to play in the, in the movie version? So yeah, I've played that game in my head. <laughs> so you mentioned The Last Jedi, so I'm assuming that you're not only a sci-fi reader, writer fan, but you're also a sci-fi movie fan. Yeah, I mean, I love Star Wars, um, have since I was a kid. I mean, I was kind of, you know, Star Wars came out the year I was born. So, uh, you know, I was a little late to it, but, um, you know, we watched the movies when I was a kid all the time and, you know, my kids like them. So, you know, sometimes we, we go to the theater if there's a new one out and, and it's fun. Any of those movies ever inspired some of the, your um, either short stories or is there something that you saw a movie that kind of worked its way into spirits? No, not really. Um, you know, uh, no, uh, not movies anyway. No. So we had a question a little ways back that um, I was wondering who you're, uh, who are you reading now and have you ever not finished a book? I have several unfinished manuscripts. So yes, I have, I have not finished some books. Um, and, you know, I don't think that I've given up on them. I think it's just a matter of they're just kind of incubating for a little while. Um, and I will eventually get back to them. Um, but um, what am I reading right now? I just started um, Chris Golden's um, Red Hands and it's really good. Um, I'm also reading um, The Fold by Peter Klein's, which is really trippy and really cool. It's this sort of weird, you know, I don't know, trippy sci-fi. <laughs> so I, it's also very good. Has there ever been a book that you just can't stand reading anymore and just quit? Or do you just continue to plow through it, soldier through it to the end just to finish it? You know, I'm, I feel like life is too short. <laughs> and if you're reading something and it's just not working for you, move on to the next one. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to name names because I think that's mean. Um, but certainly there have been things that I'm like, this is just not for me. And you move on. Um, you know, life is too short, right? Read, read things that bring you joy. Yeah, everybody's tastes are different. So you may like one book and I may, you know, that just didn't work for me and vice versa. Yeah. Have you read um, as a guilty pleasure, let's say, or just something to kind of get outside the norm of what you read? What are some books that are titles that you read that aren't typical of what you read? You know, I, I was an English major in college, so I've read a lot of just things that people would probably, you know, 
I mean, the Journal of the Plague Year, um, you know, I, you know, my 16th century English lit class, I've gotten so much stuff, Daniel Defoe and, and Jonathan Swift and, you know, just these sort of like classics. I really like a lot and, you know, I don't know necessarily that's a guilty pleasure, but it's definitely not horror. Um, I, you know, I read a lot of nonfiction too, um, mostly um, just for research and, and interesting little nuggets that I can pull out and, you know, make into something or, or reference or try to like build out into a story. So there's no like Nicholas Sparks or Danielle Steele or anything like that? Uh, no. Janet Ivanovich, she's one of my wife's favorites, but, um, you know, that would be something I would read. She's been trying to get me to read that for a long time, but, uh, you know, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. That's, that's my, um, typical genre, but occasionally I'll throw one of those in there too. Just something different. Sure. Um, um, oh, um, way back at the beginning, you had mentioned, um, your, those, um, those links. Do you want to, now that we have a few other people here um, that may see those but don't know what they are, you want to kind of recap as to what and expand on what they are? Absolutely. Um, as you guys can see in the chat, uh, in the chat box, I have dropped a couple of links to a couple of GoFundMes. Um, uh, one of them is for Dave Thomas, who has just had a, a really bad struggle uh, health-wise over the past couple of years. And um, he found they found a tumor on his lung. Uh, I think he's actually got an appointment tomorrow from what I've read on Facebook, um, but he could use a hand. Um, I know it's been a tough year for everybody, um, but if you could throw a little love his way um, through the GoFundMe, um, it'd be greatly appreciated. Um, the other link that I have up is for Lovecraft Arts and Sciences. Um, and uh, that's the organization behind Necronomicon, but they also have a store in Providence. I've read there. I know a lot of other writers have read there before. Um, and they have a shop that, uh, you know, you can offer up your work um, and they really work hard to help creative people promote their work. Um, so if you all could show some love to uh, those two GoFundMes, I'd really appreciate it. So, thank so is, you. Is, is Dave a friend of yours? Is he a fellow writer or? Dave was on the horror show with Brian Keene for a while. Um, I, I've never met Dave personally, um, but I know him from Facebook. I know him from the horror show um, and he's, you know, a nice guy. He has a sardonic sense of humor like me. So I kind of like, you know, like kindred spirit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, if anybody, again, still has any questions or anything. Um, actually, there was one here. Um, Tori, she says she, um, paraphrasing now, she loves Sarah Paulson. Um, she can play creepy as well. Have you ever seen her new movie on Hulu called Run? I have not, but now I got to head on down to Hulu and uh, check that out. So thank you for the recommendation. What's your favorite binge watching? What what show do you do you just love binge watching? You know, I'm not I'm not a huge binge watcher, but I did watch um, Stranger Things. I binged through Stranger Things um, the first I think three seasons. Uh, there are only three seasons, aren't there? Is there another one? I don't remember. But I don't know. <laughs> but I loved Stranger Things. That that was kind of like my my guilty pleasure watching. Even though there was like, I think in season two it kind of went off the rails a little bit, but. Um, I was a huge fan of Twin Peaks back in the day too, so love, uh -huh. love Twin Peaks too. Yeah, we just got on the, the Hulu train, I guess, and, and we've been binge watching The Handmaid's Tale because oh. the book was fantastic and the series itself is just very, very angering, but anyways. Um, right. Let's see, Barry says three seasons and counting. Um, would you like to talk to us about your sheds? <laughs> Arthur Two Sheds Jackson. See, my husband knows me so well. Thank you for working in an Arthur Two Sheds Jackson <laughs> reference. <laughs> what? Who? Who is Arthur Two Sheds? It's it's an old Monty Python thing, and he knows okay. that I find it hilarious. So th basically, there's this Terry Jones is this guy, and he's a composer, and he sits down to an interview, and the interviewer keeps talking about his sheds, and so he nicknames him Arthur Two Sheds because he has two sheds. And he won't ask him about his music. And it's just really absurd and funny. <laughs> so you like the whole Monty Python, Holy Grail, like Brian and all those type of things? Yeah, I was a super nerd back in the day. I watched all of them. Yeah, they were hilarious. What about some of the authors that are like that, like uh, Terry Pratchett and um, 
um, I just lost his name. Um, Discworld, not the, that's Terry Project. That is Terry. Yeah. Um. Uh. Um. I can't. I hate that one. I, it's right there, and I lose it. But um, anyways, uh, what about those type of of satire type um, comedy authors? Huge fan. I, I love Terry Pratchett. I mean, gosh, you know, so sad that he was taken from us because he was just a treasure, a treasure to the world. I love his books. It's so funny. Douglas Adams is another one. Thank you, Mac. Yeah, I love absurdist, just hilarious, you know, books like that. I, I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah, Douglas Adams is the one that I was trying yeah. to think of. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Somebody says uh, Raymond Feist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just love this quirky sort of absurdist humor. I am, I am there for it. Um, Tony says Neil Gaiman, a couple of us play uh, Gaiman as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's about it. Uh, is, did you want to read a little more from your book or is there anything else you'd like to, to talk about or? Oh, no, just thank you guys so much. And, you know, um, just so excited. Please uh, check out the GoFundMe's if you would be so kind um, and um, give a shout out to my husband, Matt. Thank you so much for all your support and being so awesome. And um, thank you all beautiful people for coming. Um, and Sherry's book, you know, of course, is available through her, her website, through Haver House Publishing. It's also available um, for, for us, for bookstores, is through bookshop.org. And I was going to get it. It's on my list to get. Um, but it's tight right now, of course, but, um, you know, where I'm getting down the list. So we'll have it in our store as well. And as soon as we do, we'll post it on our social media and stuff when we have it. But for now, uh, if you still want to support us or your other local bookstore, uh, go to bookshop.org and you can find her works there. Um, and, uh, you know, next, uh, let's see, we're taking a couple days off from doing this and we'll be back next Monday with Steve Van Sampson and his books about African vampires, um, really good books. Um, and plus his new one that uh, just came out as well. So we'll probably see you, we'll hopefully see everybody in a few days. But uh, Sherry, thank you very much for being with us. Everybody, thank you very much for, for joining us and good luck with the book. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.